Greetings to you wherever you are in the world. My name is Wendy Osborne, Senior Consultant with IAVE. And on behalf of IAVE, I am delighted you, to welcome you to our 2021 Thought Leadership Webinars. A short series of four sessions between February and May on the theme of volunteering for social change, with a particular focus on volunteerism and social activism. Please note that the webinars will be recorded and available on the IAVE website. I also want to draw your attention to a few of the features on the Zoom control panel. So if you're having trouble hearing the presentation using your computer audio, try switching your audio settings to phone audio to call in. Please also note the raise your hand icon during the session, the presenter may ask participants to raise their hands to provide non-verbal feedback. However, perhaps the most important feature I would draw to your attention is the question, the Q&A icon. Please do send in your written questions to the panel. We really value your participation. This first webinar is about volunteerism and social activism. And it revisits a paper that was published by IAVI, Civicus, and the United Nations Volunteers over a decade ago, exploring the concepts behind the terminology and the alignment between individuals involved in volunteering and social action that supports and develops people's participation in social change. I hope you may have already got a copy of the paper, but if you haven't, please download it uh, from the Abbey website. We have asked our moderator today, Christopher Malora, to give a critique of the paper, considering what our experience of the world teaches us in 2021, and to lead a discussion with a great lineup of panel members whose lives and work are having a positive impact on key humanitarian issues. Please do engage with your written comments and questions. Now to introduce our moderator and presenter. Originally from the Philippines, Chris Malora is currently finishing his PhD with the UNESCO Chair in Adult Literacy and Learning for Social Transformation at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Although he does join us from his home in the Philippines today. His doctoral research is an 11 month ethnography of the learning dimension of local volunteering by vulnerable youths and adults in an HIV AIDS awareness group and informal settlers movement in the Philippines. Chris comes with quite a bit of experience. He's recently worked with the UN volunteers developing a volunteer typology for the 21st century in preparation for the global technical meeting that was held last year on reimagining volunteering for the 2030 agenda. He holds an MA in lifelong learning policy and management from the University College London. So we're delighted that he is giving his experience and his knowledge uh, and sharing that with us today. Thanks again, Christopher, and our esteemed panel members. Chris, it is now over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy. And um, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Um, just to say that I'm going to, to do a bit of a critique of the paper for the next about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're going to hear from our panelists uh, who's going to illustrate some of the aspects of the, of the, of the critique that I'm going to talk about. Um, right, so again, thank you so much for Ayave for inviting me and it is, it is truly an honor to be part of this uh, global forum. If you can just um, go on to the next slide. So my role today is to have a bit of a critique on the 2007 and 2008 paper um, on volunteerism and social activism. And I think um, even before that, just to give a little bit of a background, there's already um, a lot of um, arguments within volunteering research that the field of volunteerism and the field of social activism has moved forward as two different fields within, within the literature. And um, a lot of the dichotomy between volunteering and social activism is about power. So volunteering, like what Henriksen and Svedberg has observed here in 2010, volunteering is a concept devoid of power right? Um, while there is an explicit or implicit orientation towards power and social change and activism. So there this seems to be the, 
the 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 main dichotomy between the two wherein um volunteering is powerless while social activism is all about power volunteerism is about maintaining the status quo while um, like for example providing services or you know being part of an organization and then uh, distributing flyers and things like this it's not it does not involve power at all while social activism is about challenging the status quo it's about um you know, going on protests and asking governments to to change certain ways of doing and, and trying to challenge uh, dominant political structures. I personally do not agree that this dichotomy should exist and that this dichotomy is, is, um, is accurate. In fact, what the 2007-2008 paper was able to contribute to that conversation, if you can just go on to the next slide, Jessica, what the 2007 and 2008 paper uh, was able to do is to propose the three links on uh, social activism and volunteering. So there are three. First, both foster participation. Number two, both focus on purpose and change. And number three is both are tools for development. In a way, what the paper is trying to say, and this is the main thesis of the paper um, based on my interpretation, is that as you can see in the title, both um, volunteering and social activism are ways to participate towards um, human development. These are forms of participation. Um, however, my argument for this evening, evening in the Philippines, is that um, finding commonalities between the two is not enough. I think what is important is for us to understand the role of power and power relationships between both concepts. And I think just saying that both are the same or forms of participation does not really answer the question, what is the role of power then or power relationships in volunteering and in social activism? And I think the key to that is understanding that word there called participation. Um, participation, for many of you who have worked in the de in development studies or in development programs, um, participation has been the orth orthodoxy, the new orthodoxy of development, right? It's about bringing people at the margins into the center. It is about providing power to people who were previously powerless. And I think having a more critical view of participation will allow us to have a more critical view, both of volunteering and social activism. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Jessica. What I've understand in my own research um, on participation and community participation and youth participation in development is that participation is not one thing, right? So questions around participation. So when you argue that both volunteering and social activism are forms of participation, there are bigger questions there around power. One is, for example, who participates? Um, who participates in what? Who defines the, the method of participation or the process of participation? What is the outcome of participation? And I think the most important thing is what is the quality of participation? What is the extent of participation? Questions such as, is attending something participation? When you attend this webinar, is it about is it is this participation? When you give feedback, let's say with your local government, is that participation? So these are kinds of questions of power and questions around ownership and questions around agency. And what I think this ladder is useful, this is by this is adapted from Hart in 1992. Um, that talked about children's participation. What this ladder allows us to understand is that there are many different levels of participation and there's even non-participation. So at the lowest level, you see here manipulation, decoration, and tokenism. And at the highest degree of participation, it's about youth-initiated programs with shared decisions with adults. Now, I think this kind of thing is important because it tells us that actually every activity could be a political activity. So for instance, if you distribute say for example, flyers. When people think that's, a, no, that's actually just distributing fly, uh, uh, flyers, right? It's not controversial, it's not political, it's, not, it, it's devoid of power, but actually there are many programs where the roles of volunteers are very tokenistic or, very um, or some are about decoration. Um, I, I just finished an interview with a social activist in the Philippines for another research project I'm doing. And he was telling me that he was invited in this, um, government forum as the youth representative, as the social activist representative, but actually 
in the five hour meeting, he was just given five minutes uh, to speak about the young people's concerns. So what he was trying to tell me is that, well, I was there almost like a decoration so that they can check the, 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 the box that a young person has participated. My invitation to you is when we look at things like social activism and, and, and volunteering is to look at levels of participation. What kind of participation are we, are we developing? What kind of participation is possible within the kinds of programs that we create? Um, next slide, please. What is interesting about the COVID-19 pandemic, I feel as a researcher and someone who has researched uh, volunteering um, for the past couple of years is that a lot of the social structures um, that we have come to know is changing. So there are no more single ways of doing things. There's, there's so much diverse responses to what has been happening during COVID. And I think this gives us a very good lesson around participation, right? That there are many different forms of participation and there are people who are actually carving their space um, within some of these debates, there are cracks within the systems and people are filling in that gaps. Um, the picture that you can see here is the picture of young people that I've, I've uh, worked with as part of my research for the past three years. It's an ethnographic study of volunteering in the Philippines. What they're doing here is um, distributing HIV, uh, sorry, distributing condoms in the streets of Iloilo City where I was living. Some people would say that this is simply service delivery, something that you associate with volunteering. But actually, this could also be a political act. This is distributing condoms, contraception, in a country where 98% of the people are practicing Roman Catholics. So it could be a political act. In fact, a lot of the things that they do as young people is, um, is to lobby for policy. They were able to help lobby a policy that lowers down the, the HIV, the, the giving of consent from 18 to 15 to get an HIV test. And a lot of their work is about raising awareness how do we make people understand that HIV is, is not a death sentence? How do we make them understand about the science of the disease? So, and then after that, when COVID hit, they went back to service delivery. They went back to delivering medicine to HIV positive patients. The dichotomy that, that is very popular between volunteering and social activism is very limiting because it is not able to capture how certain things change over time in response to various social changes. And we're seeing this even in social movements. So when you read social movements literature at the time of COVID, they always say that social movements are pivoting. And that pivot, uh, the, the process of pivoting is about putting all the campaigns online. But actually we're also seeing examples that it's not just about moving things online. A lot of the social movements are changing the kind of services or actions that they do. Many of them have produced san sanitizers on their own. Many of them have, you know, uh, have developed mental health programs or, um, you know, they develop one-on-one uh, yeah, -on -one sessions with older people. Um, in my paper for Ayabe, the previous paper I did, I wrote about this um, case study of an LGBT, of a group of LGBT activists who, since they could not go and march uh, for rallies because of, of COVID-19, what they did is they uh, delivered services and delivered goods and services and masks and um, sanit um, hand washing, uh, sorry, soap and, and all those things to people who are in need, which are near their community. So pivoting in terms of the way that things change now it's not only about moving things online, but also changing the kind of services and the kind of activism that is available. Um, and that, like, like for me, that is a really important aspect of trying to fit or trying to problematize that dichotomy that has been very ingrained in some of the conversations around volunteering and social activism. Okay, so unfortunately, you can go to the last slide. Um, unfortunately, I cannot give you a definitive answer whether um, the two are different and to what extent um, are they the same. I think one of the things that I asked myself when I was preparing for this presentation was that, is it really important to, to determine whether they're different or not? Or a better question is, under which circumstances should this dichotomy be helpful? And under which circumstances um, do this differentiation of definitions are not really important or does not really make sense. What I would suggest is that instead of looking at them as binaries, perhaps it's better to think of them as dimensions or forms of expressions. 
So um, what I can tell you when I visited the paper is that uh, with the changing ways and diversity of how people engage and participate in development programs, it is very limiting to think of this as, as binaries. Um, for me, every act could be political. Every act could be a political act. Every act could both could be continuing, changing, or completely disrupting the status quo. It just happens in different magnitudes. So and this is one of the things that I was arguing in another paper that I wrote is that um, I think let's go beyond asking the different types of volunteering, but how, how volunteering actually is expressed differently across different contexts. So these are the three theses of, of our three main findings from that paper that, you know, between volunteering and social activism, volunteerism and social activism, both of them foster participation. For me, there's a bigger question, and that is what kind or level or quality of participation is facilitated or even possible? What is the degree of participation? Who is allowed to participate and who is not allowed to participate? Um, the paper says both volunteerism and social change, uh, social activism focuses on purpose and change. But to what extent is this change possible? And what kind of change are we looking at? So this question of who defines what change is, I think, um, um, gives rise to a very important aspect of, of the dichotomy, and that is ownership. To what extent can people take ownership of some of the programs and service delivery and activist movements that they have conducted? And the other thing is they, um, they argue that both volunteering and social activism are tools for development, but never do we ask what kind of development, right? If you're disaggregate development, it could mean many different things, right? Development could be peace building, development could be gender empowerment, development could be zero hunger, or some people think that, you know, um, having white supremacy, um, even in 2021 or 2020, is development. So there are different forms of development, and you have to be very critical about the kind of development that our program is facilitating, and of course, the question of for whom, who benefits in this particular form of development. So our two, the three people who's going to speak to us next um, actually is, exemplifies and may provide answers to some of these questions, really. Um, the very fir the, the first person, Samuel Omo, who's the founder and CEO of Mungaro Matani. I hope I pronounced that right. I practiced many times. Uh, but Samuel um, can tell us a bit more about ownership and I think his story, and he can tell you more about that, and the founding of this particular organization tells us about um, the importance of ownership, people carving their space in the society, volunteers or social activists, whatever you want to call them, but these are people who want change. And Samuel can tell you a bit about that and what he was able to do um, with, with kind of his passion towards volunteerism and activism. And we have the other person is Wolfgang Krell, who is the executive director of Augsburg Volunteer Center and a member of the Ayavi Board of Directors who can tell us a bit more about partnerships and relationships and how do you, um, how do you um, fight for change um, when you have to work with many different people across different levels? I'm talking about policy, I'm talking about um, other NGOs. And I think Wolfgang's example would be really good and um, especially in how he was able to work with refugees particularly as part of their, of their program. And finally, we have um, Hakan Karaman, who unfortunately will not be able to will not be able to join us live. Uh, Hakan is a co-founder of IFAA or Initiative for Refugees. He has a video uh, video message later. So these are just some of the early ideas I have. As you, you probably could feel that it's a bit um, muddled. Uh, maybe there's there's space to write another paper, maybe a follow up paper on on the 2007 2008 paper. We can have those kind of important questions around power and power relationships and really find commonalities between these two concepts. So I'll stop now and I'll give the floor over to Samuel, who will be able to share with us his story. Thank you so much.
Hello, and uh, hope that everyone is okay. My name is uh, Samuel Omol, and uh, I am the founder of Marum Tani, and I'm honored to join this webinar today. Thank you, Yave, for this chance. So, Marum Tani is a, is a small community-based organization based in Kenya, and we are registered under the Kenya CAPT. So what do we do? We started this initiative. I started it uh, 2013. And the reason why I started this uh, initiative is because I came, I came from a very humble background. I lost my parents when I was uh, around uh, nine years. Then uh, the life that I went through pushed me to start to come up with this uh, initiative because these are just the problems that we were facing when I was in the street. So I found myself in the street as a street boy. And then let alone, I was supported by one of the national uh, NGOs in Kenya, known as, Mungaru, uh, known as World Vision and other church organization. So when I came up with this organization, is uh, I started collecting clothes from, from, the, from people and then giving it to the vulnerable people in the society. So through that, I started learning that there are a lot of problems that we need to come up and change. So through social media, that is Facebook, uh, we managed to pull up volunteers to join hands with many people, just for just in a brief, we, we joined hand and then we registered this organization 2016. So Mungaro Mtani means, Mungaro means to shine and Mtani is the hood. The other, is, the other thing is that we have uh, five programs within Mungaro Mtani and that is, uh, we do uh, economic empowerment, we do uh, clothing for peace, because you know, in clothing for peace, during, during elections in Kenya, there's a lot of uh, uh, chaos after elections. So we decided to come up with this idea, clothing for peace, whereby we, know, we unite Kenyans through clothing. We also do, uh, we restore dignity through clothing, whereby we look for people who are not well dressed and then we dress them from people who have just donated these clothes to us. Uh, also, we do something called uh, economic empowerment, where we identify projects uh, and identify vulnerable uh, uh, people in the society who wants to use, who wants to go to do other vocational trainings. We give them life skills trainings, and then we introduce them to other partners who can take them to school. So that is economic empowerment. And also, we have sports that we use sports as a me as a medium of. Uh, Interaction, inter, interaction with the youth and talking about drugs and crime in the in the slums. So these are some of the things that we do. Uh, you can also see us on, um, uh, we also do something called a mentorship whereby we do school mentorship programs. We talk to girls and give them sanitary towels and also give boys boxers in terms of hygiene. So we do a lot in the community with our partners and with our, with our, <clears throat> with our volunteers. So we have, so far we have like a, uh, 50 volunteers, but 20 of them are the ones who are on daily basis. They don't, they, they show up when we have activities. So that's all about Mungarum Tani. We stick to our slogan, we value the vulnerable. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel, with, uh, with that presentation. And I think one of the things we can really uh, learn from Samuel's presentation is that uh, both volunteering and social activism both are social activities, but also they're very personal. So um, Samuel's example is that, you know, his story was able to inspire him to, to conduct these activities in his community. Now I'll, I'll give it for over now to um, Wolfgang. Uh, Wolfgang, will be able to join us now? Thanks. Yeah, hello. So uh, Chris, thank you. Thank you to Ayave, Ayave for this uh, possibility to present some of our projects for refugees here in Augsburg. Um, <clears throat> about my bio can read in the program. The Volunteer Center Augsburg was uh, founded in 1997 and it works like a normal volunteer center all around the world. <clears throat> and um, Augsburg, just to give some information about the city of Augsburg, we have around uh, 300,000 inhabitants and are situated about 80 kilometers in the west of Munich in Bavaria, Germany. And we have a special situation here in Augsburg because uh, almost 50% of our inhabitants have a, a migration history or as we would call it in German, a migration background. And I want to start uh, with a poem from Bertolt Brecht, a famous German poet and playwright, born in 1898 
in Augsburg and uh, he died in 19, 1956 in Berlin. And uh, for me, this poem, A Bed for the Night, really highlights the discussion of today about volunteerism and social activism. His views about the lacking fight against exploitation, injustice and inequality, but you can turn it around uh, too. Would it make sense to fight for years for more justice when those homeless people need a bed for this night, for tonight? So this for me uh, shows that volunteers are playing a crucial role in crisis, which is actually in the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have seen it here in Germany in 2015 in the refugee crisis um, all around Europe and in Germany especially. Almost 1 million refugees fled to Germany in, two, uh, in 2015 and 100,000 of active citizens helped them to integrate in this new country. And together with the city of Augsburg, the Volunteer Center Augsburg started different projects, volunteering projects for uh, refugees, uh, the so-called helping circles in the quarter of the city. In many quarters of the city, local authorities have to open uh, homes for refugees. And together with this opening of, of houses, uh, normally a local initiative in the quarter started. There have been parishes, sporting clubs, active citizens of the quarter to start such a um, helping circle. And the volunteer center supported those circles of recruiting with coordination and offered trainings on asylum law, intercultural sensitivity, and knowledge about support refugees. <clears throat> more than 300 volunteers are active since then in those helping circles, and the focus is now more in education, professional training, finding jobs and housing for uh, those refugees, being most of them staying for years already here in Germany, here in Augsburg. Um, and even former refugees are now volunteering for the new citizens coming to Augsburg. Another project are refugee mentors, uh, volunteers supporting in a one-to-one -one mentorship unaccompanied minor refugees. Sure, they get help in the well-established youth welfare system here in Germany, but those mentors are really a surplus on all this professional support. They are expanding the German knowledge, troubleshooting issues at school or at the job, helping manage personal issues, and most of all, providing company through leisure activities. More than 80 volunteers are active here now. The third project is sports and integration. <clears throat> Here we pair refugees to sports clubs and to find sports clubs who, which would offer possibilities for uh, special sport activities of refugees. Example given Afghan refugees willing to play cricket that is really unknown here in Augsburg. <clears throat> and last project, those ambassadors, ambassadors of multiplicity. Uh, aiming in a wider sense to all migrants but not but to to native citizens here in Augsburg we are just now in next years losing the native majority in Augsburg and that is an important point for the near future but to and it's not an important point how to integrate new coming citizens but how to live together in peace and tolerance so those ambassadors are trained in diversity and Together, they start activities to promote this multiplicity in Augsburg and just to, to raise the self-confidence of the people living here, that they are very um, trained now already in multiplicity and diversity because even the small children are growing up in this diversity already in Augsburg. We are really deeply convinced that citizens are integrating citizens as neighbors, colleagues, teammates and sports clubs, and the professional are just supporting this integration with their efforts and with their knowledge. What was the impact in Augsburg with these all active citizens being engaged with and for uh, refugees? And these are not the, uh, the volunteers only from the volunteer center, but from other partner organizations, from corporations like our partner, the Tür and Tür Association, that means living next door, <clears throat> the welfare system, the charity uh, associations, and many others. I think that they are functioning as ambassadors, ambassadors for tolerance, tolerance for diversity, for welcoming foreigners in our city. And as we look back, we can say that they really had, had a big influence to this still now um, really peaceful atmosphere. <clears throat> in our local community. So volunteers are not only helping, they are just 
uh, supporting refugees to fight for their rights, to get all the support of the welfare state and the local administration. So advocacy is this, for me an advocacy in an individual way, part of uh, is and it is part of voluntary work. Um, they are supporting the foreigners to integrate, to find self-confidence in their new hometown and to be active themselves for the other people in need. So I see volunteerism and social activism as two sides of the one coin. And we need some partners too, like the Bavarian Refugee Council on the state level, like uh, the Association Pro Asyl on national level. These are our partners too, to fight for the rights of refugees. So. <clears throat> that would be, be my presentation. And I want to introduce Hakan. Hakan is one of our, has been one of our volunteers, but now even uh, leader of an uh, association he has founded. Um, you can see that citizens are too empowering new citizens for uh, to be active in the community, to be active as themselves as volunteers. So uh, <clears throat> that is just one example, Hakan, with his uh, work he's doing and his uh, association he has founded. So we hear now a short video with an uh, <clears throat> presentation of Hakan and his volunteering. Hello to everyone, my name is Hakan. I worked as a school principal in many countries for a long time. Due to current political situation in my country, I had to take refuge in Germany. As a refugee, I could find a chance to observe the problems and needs of the refugees, and I decided to take active parts in solving of those problems. But I didn't know how to do it. When I found Augsburg Volunteer Center, I said that, okay, that's what, what I was looking for. And uh, I saw that here a lot of volunteers help others in many different projects and two of them were really interesting to me, uh, refugee guides and ambassadors of diversity. And I took necessary educations and trainings and for two years I'm active in these two projects. Besides volunteer centers of Augsburg, six of my friends and I established a citizens initiative which is called IFA, to help refugees. Seven people we have started and now our volunteers reached up to 100 and many of them are refugees. So I can say so, refugees help other refugees and we are trying to give them moral support. We are helping them to find a rental place and we are giving them uh, interpretation supports when they need and we are very glad to be able to help the other refugees. Great. Um, thank you very much uh, to Hakan, who unfortunately didn't join us, and Wolfgang also. I would like to call on the, the not the stage, but the Zoom room. Maybe Samuel, if you could turn on your camera, um, it would be good to have a conversation around some of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A. I think Wolfgang's example and also Hakan's example is not only about diversity in terms of the kind of activities that you've been involved with, um, Wolfgang, but also there's that very strong focus on relationship building, I think, between you and the refugees and also the other um, partners that you have. And you can talk a bit more about that later, um, also with Samuel's um, and input. Um, again, I'd like just like to remind everyone that, you know, for the next uh, until uh, for the next about 20 minutes, we could have a Q&A. And if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them on the Q&A window um, and we'll be able to field them field them to the to the panelist. Okay, I think we can begin with questions around, you know, I think in my presentation earlier, and I think reading about your work, one of the things that, you know, um, we talk about a lot within voluntary and social activism is the concept of change, that both types of activities um, have a certain aspiration to a certain form of change. So I guess my question to both of you is, what kind of change or development were you hoping to achieve through the kind of work uh, you're doing? Maybe we'll begin with you, Samuel, and you can talk a bit more about the pandemic, um, uh, the, your work during the pandemic. Oh, thank you very much, uh, brother Chris. And uh, what I can say about uh, our work during pandemic, because of course, when the pandemic strike, uh, that is a few months ago, uh, Kenya was, uh, was we were not sure 
whether it will hit the way it has just struck us. So it caught us unaware. So as Mungarum Tani, we started with the sensitization of uh, uh, people to tell them, in the, you know, most of the people uh, are living in the slums and those are the vulnerable people who we are looking up of. So we started with the sensitization of hand wash and then again, we started uh, giving them uh, masks and how to put on uh, demonstration on how to put on masks and later on, we saw that people were washing their hands without what with water, and this water was not uh, was not uh, was not enough. So we started to collect bus stops, whereby we use Facebook and other social media to uh, to call for support, and then we 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 managed to give a thousand people bus stops, whereby they use this to wash yeah. their hands. So we also set up like a, like twenty hand wash places in the slums. So this was the other thing, these are things that we did. So after that, then again, you see there was a need. There's a need of gender-based uh, gender -based violence within the community because everybody was at home because of the lockdown, the children and the, the situation, the, the, the way people live in the slums. You see, they live in a very open area. There's, there's no way that you can have yourself in a lockdown because it's like a market, people live together. So what we saw is a, uh, People started abusing children and also some uh, some things like crime and also there was a lo loss of job and this uh, also led to depression. So uh, we started talking to youths. We came up with an idea that is called uh, uh, periods don't stop for pandemic, whereby we use this uh, hashtag to call upon many people to support us, give young yeah. girls, young vulnerable, young vulnerable girls. Uh, sanitary towels. Uh, as, the time, as that time, we were also talking to them about their their, their rights and how to control yeah. themselves at home. Because you know, most of the Kenyan uh, families, uh, 90, 90, in, in like uh, sixty percent, parents are not with the children because children are at school, uh, parents are at uh, their workplaces, and see, so yeah. we 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 had a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of cases uh, on on. Uh, on parents and also on the other side from the children. The other thing is that we we, we saw we saw a need and the children were really uh, we, because of the lo lo loss of job. Uh, we started a mm. program called Lunch in Tani. This is a this is a slang. We started giving out uh, lunch. We we we, call, we 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 started giving children packed lunch and this lunch because most of the children they were not going they were going out going without food maybe yeah. once or. So yeah. we started up with this idea. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think I think that those are kind of really I think what what you the examples you've shown are really contextual responses. So you're responding to the very real needs of your community. But what actually struck you with your uh, struck me, uh, what really struck me with your presenta presentation just now is you were talking about how you were trying to make people understand their rights. And I yes, think that yeah. kind of relates to some of the to some of the issues that Wolfgang actually said earlier about you trying to make sure that people understand their rights as well, Wolfgang. Can you tell us a bit more about that? And maybe I think that kind of relates also to this um, question of change. What kind of change do you want to see with some of the programs you're, you're, you're developing? Wolfgang? So I think it's a big social change is really a big topic, but uh, I think that um, our first point is always to say that um, we need active citizens as a surplus to all the efforts in our society because we are deeply convinced that uh, with uh, active citizens and volunteers, you can have something special in the support for people in need. So and that is now our our task to, to open organizations, to open the administration, to open the departments of the city of Augsburg and even uh, <clears throat> charities for volunteering and for active citizens. Because I think that those active citizens with their resources, with their knowledge, with their competences, with their time, they are really changing <clears throat> something in our society. And that is was this one point that we can head up a positive atmosphere for foreigners here in our city of Augsburg 
because so many citizens have been active and even uh, yeah, supporting those foreigners, those new citizens, as we would say, um, even to participate in our society, in our local community and to find a new role as the new citizens and as nat coming, becoming native citizens in some years. So this is an important point for us, how we can change the situation, how we can change Augsburg, yeah. but two, how we can um, held up a positive atmosphere for yeah. people in need and to participate them. Yeah. Sorry, um, Samuel, did you want to add something to that? I can see that you're raising your hand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what I can say is that um, here in uh, Kenya, we have seen uh, volunteers, a lot of volunteers uh, showing up because during this pandemic, we have seen new recruits on volunteers. And these are people, we, we have just made them to be inspired from what we, we've been doing as Mangadam Tani. So we saw many people coming to organization. They want to volunteer with us because uh, they saw that the way we were bringing a big change in the society. And uh, we, we believe that uh, through this, uh, act, uh, it's like activism in another way, talking to people to help other people and then other people coming to join you. It, it shows that uh, yeah. people, uh, they were seeing the good work that we as volunteers, not government, but volunteers, people for people supporting other people. So we had yeah. we had a massive uh, recruit within our our, yeah. our organization. Yeah. Just because just because they saw what we were doing. So I think yeah. we are we are volunteers are doing a great job, and uh, we, we 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 just need to be open to them and help. Yeah. In, in everyone, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's so good of an example where there's actually a rise of volunteering. I mean, there's I mean, some people would say with the, with the dawn of the pandemic that isolation would keep people to themselves and it and you know do things on their own. But I think with with um, there are examples, really good examples of how mutual aid groups have actually um, yes. you know grown in the process of, during the pandemic. So that's yes, that's, a, that's just, a good example. Just a minute, just before you finish, Chris. Yeah. Let me just confirm to you that in Kenya we were. Volunteers contribute around 47% of this pandemic response. That we, we, we did a very good job as volunteers. Yeah. 47% were volunteers. They were, they, were not, they, they were taking risk of their lives to support other people. So that is what I can say. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good example. In fact, that kind of relates to one of the questions here in the, in the chat, uh, in the Q&A box. Um, particularly to you, Samuel, but I think, Wolfgang, you could, you could chime in here. I think it's a question about partnerships. How do you partner with politicians, especially from different sides or different parties, et cetera, um, when it comes to the implementation of your volunteer work, especially at the grassroots level, especially when it comes to kind of social activist kinds of movements? How do you partner with, or how do you deal with kind of changing politics in your, in your society? Wolfgang, did you wanna give us a start on that and then Samuel could follow? Welcome, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think that it's just needed to, to be in contact, in regular contact with the politics and the, the people who are responsible at the city administration to discuss the problems and to, to push forward the understanding of how important active citizens are really. And um, that is sure a point of time so you need some time, some years to, to have a standing <clears throat> in the local community. <clears throat> and it's um, on the other side, I think, too, kind of uh, the problem or, or the uh, thing of, of having numbers for volunteers. If you have uh, many volunteers behind you supporting your courses, then you get, um, yeah, you get the politics too to discuss something, to change something. So, and sure, the volunteer center is now more than 20 years. And in all our projects, we have 1,600 volunteers. So that is quite a, a sum of active citizens uh, who are important for a city like Augsburg. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even yeah. there are even more volunteers in other associations and our partner associations. Exactly. So yeah. when citizens are um, participating in the uh, local causes, then you get uh, even uh, the contact to politics because, yeah, uh, yeah in interested to, to see what citizens are wanting, are wishing, and what they're doing. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not just about state and um, citizens, but also non-state actors like NGOs and other charity sure. organizations. Interesting. Samuel. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Chris. I think uh, partnership, this is uh, about SDG number 17. And uh, 
you know, volunteers, we contribute to SDG, uh, that is uh, zero hunger. Sometimes we support, we also support the number eight, SDG number four, that is gender equality. And, a, and a law among them, among what Mungarutani are doing is a partnership. And you cannot achieve all this without partnership. So for us, uh, uh, the only difficulties that we are having with the politicians, and they feel like we are we are in a competition world with them, and uh, we are. It is a, it is sometimes very tricky for us until they understand what we are doing to the community because they feel like we are a threat. Sometimes the people tend to call us uh, honorables, <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. they feel threatened. And this one is uh, something that we are trying to look. So, what yeah. the best the best way that we have been. Uh, uh, doing pr uh, practical practices with the politicians is uh, we go through the religious leaders. We don't work with the political uh, kingsmen. We work with the religious mm -hmm. leaders and we work with the we work with the administration. So when we work with the administration, then they will see this is something that is supported with the government. So that's how we try and uh, give them a shoulder. Yeah. But we yeah. tell them that we don't have any grudges. But other people. Other organizations, uh, we are working with them in partnership. They know our, they know what we do. If they know that you are giving back to the community directly, then they will work with you. If they know that yeah. you are saving lives, then they will work with you. Yeah. But for political, for political purposes, sometimes it is hard to work with politicians yeah. Yeah. because yes. all most of the time, most of the time yeah. they have they have their own grudges, so they feel right. threatened when we are responding to these yeah. things like pandemic. Right. And then yeah. they have started naming us as a politi pandemic politicians. Yeah, you yeah. see, they feel like we are. We are yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's a good. I mean, that's a really good example, right? Of how something as as you know something that as simple perhaps as as delivering services or humanitarian, a kind of giving giving aid and giving um, food packages, etc., could be politicized. And I, I'm also seeing that here in the Philippines where a lot of um, people who are just delivering um, stuff to, to poorer communities, they are being framed as, as activists and they are being framed as people who are against the state. And there are many different tactics to stop them. So that is an example actually of how volunteering could be politicized and how volunteering exists within a political system, a political structure and a, a society or an environment where there are many different power relationships, not just between the state and, and the volunteers or the state with the non-state actors, as in your example, Wolfgang, but also other institutions like religion, religious institutions, education institutions, etc. There's so many kind of complex partnerships that, that, we're, um, that we're looking at. Okay, um, there's... Other questions here, and I think one of that is for Wolfgang specifically. Um, how do you combat hate towards refugees when organizing these activities? Do you address it intentionally or just react when necessary? I see a lot of hate in Croatia at the moment, um, opposed to 2015 when we had a huge wave of refugee passing through our country. So any, any thoughts on this, Wolfgang? Yeah, we have another situation here in Germany in that we have lower numbers of, of uh, incoming refugees because uh, <clears throat> you see there's a, a very difficult role of the European Union playing with all the neighbor states or uh, yeah to to help out refugees and to stop them at the frontier. So uh, this is a point that uh, is really crucial for here in Germany that um, the problems are in other countries of the European Union member states are being at the direct frontier to non-member states. So um, that is a point and uh, we really um, think that uh, we want to help those refugees coming to Augsburg, but at the same time we are very thankful for the work of Pro Asyl here in Germany, thankful for um, the, the big welfare association doing this advocacy for the rights of refugees too on the other side or the Bavarian Refugee Council, <clears throat> which is important and uh, very critical to the government, to the, government, to the uh, no, federal government. And um, sure, these are um, necessary partners to our work just to, to, to give another uh, by the taste to all those what active citizens can do on the local level. And they are sure many of them are volunteers uh, at the same time to uh, being uh, doing advocacy for the rights of refugees. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting point. Um, there's another there's another question here, um, Samuel, or maybe welcome if you if you would want to answer as well. Um, one of the questions here is about resistance to change, and as you've seen, as you've explained earlier, Samuel, in your example, um, that you have increased um, number of volunteers who, who participated because of the pandemic, but there are also other um, volunteers who who, who feels that it's so difficult to move things, every, to move everything online. And there's a question here, how do you manage that? How do you deal with resistance? Um, and how do you kind of engage volunteers in many different modes? Because we've, uh, many things have, have, have been online. Samuel? Maybe if I take it first, uh, I just want to say, uh, Chris, you know, being, uh, being a, a mass communication, I'm a mass communication student, that's a, I'm a broadcast student, I'm a broadcast student. So I used my ideas, my what I learned from school, how to come to 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 in, in, engage people. So communication was the first thing that I started. I started breaking this communication because you know very well many people at this time they think that uh, it is a risk to, uh, to respond to pandemic because the way everything it is, you see the numbers are rising and everything. So we had we had also a flap down of our volunteers. Some of them. So that risk, and they decided they will never come out until everything comes to normal. But others decided, let them be with us. So what we do is uh, we try to work with them in social media, to work with, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily that they, they appear on when we are doing, when, when we are responding. They, only, they can also contribute on what social media, what campaigns, and also help us in fundraising. So some of them were helping us in fundraising at the backyard of other people who are also in the in the in the real life uh, responding to the community. So we 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 had a mixed reaction, Chris. And Walter, how about in your experience? Sure. Under under the situation now of the COVID nineteen pandemic, we have big problems with our partners. As schools are closed, the pupils can't volunteer in one of our youth engagement projects. The or the NGOs normally uh, being open for those young volunteers are, are not allowed to to uh, have external persons inside. So we have big problems with the COVID nineteen pandemic to to um, run the project like we we have done it but i think that resistance are uh, is an important point and to, to know why they are resisting to a change because uh, in europe uh, data protection data security is a big problem and a big issue so that is uh, to be careful uh, with data uh, would be a first point many people many volunteers are very um, careful of and uh, distanced to digitalization, but uh, sure we have to train. We have to to have uh, the resources for technical resources for uh, doing uh, more on a digital way. So I think that um, in many things it will be uh, in the future hybrid version of volunteering online and in an analog way. To because many volunteers say now to us that they uh, lack this personal meeting and that even a, a personal meeting can bring more than 10 uh, phone calls so this is lacking now this the distance right. is uh, mm -hmm. giving problems to the support uh, from one person to the other person mm -hmm. but that is uh, sure the problem of the whole of society yeah yeah, yeah. well sorry i I'm just very aware of the time and we don't have a lot of time left and I would want to pick up one more question. I'm sorry for those who were not able to answer. There's so many questions here around, you know, um, volunteering and inclusion, which is also very important around social activism and env environmental activism, which is also, I think, a very interesting topic. But I'd like us to close by talking about futures. What do you think is the future of volunteering and social activism in the context of your work? And one of the very interesting questions here is, um, from how can we be aware of and support those volunteers who we think have the capacity to be new change makers? So I think it's a very good question because it talks about the future of the kind of work that you're doing, but also who is going to you know, take your place at some point and take on leadership roles at some point. So any quick thoughts on that? Um, uh, maybe Samuel, you want to start? And then we can go to Wolfgang and then we close. Okay, I hope that you are hearing me. So, first thing is uh, we need to to rejoice volunteers. We need to make them 
no, uh, we need to give them applause. I need to give everyone that is a volunteer, whatever they are watching, either from Nigeria or all volunteers, you need to clap yourself. And I will give my uh, 10 seconds for just a clap, everybody to clap for a volunteer for this pandemic response. Because if we don't rejoice them, yeah, we need to give them that hand because they are doing a great job. The other thing is, uh, we need to come up with organizations that can bring volunteers together like Ayave. And I, I appreciate this uh, opportunity because this is now where we can cook our ideas and make them to a real meal and see how we can support volunteers because behind doing all this that we are doing, we have other challenges. People think that volunteers are, uh, are millionaires. Some of us, we just do these things and we end up uh, sleeping in, in the floor, maybe even chased away of, from in our offices, like for me right now, my office, we have we are not even opening our offices because of rent areas. And the people that we are giving back to the community, the people that we are serving, they feel like we are we are rich men and they come knocking to our doors every day. Oh, my child did not do this. I have a sick baby. So we need to have like a volunteer uh, a global fund whereby we can have some small funds to facilitate our administration uh, projects because we need to also to, to do the runnings, and that is now where we can also empower volunteers. And in that way, I'm thinking yeah. of sustainable projects within the volunteer. Volunteers must have sustainable projects within their organization, yeah. whereby they can give some small incomes. And that's where now we need to go. That's how we can maintain yeah. volunteers. Yeah. yeah, thank you for those very concrete suggestions. And um, hopefully, please do get in touch with Samuel if you want to talk about um, you know developing some projects together or. Um, some of these ideas to you know to 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 make them come to to life. Wolfgang, any other? Um, but looking into the future, I'm very critical to the uh, talking. Many people are talking about to come back to old normality, but we have seen in our experiences last year with COVID-19 that old people have been lonely before COVID-19 already. That uh, many people didn't get the help they they need. And if you look at the all the the issues of the SDGs 2030, then um, I would be very critical to look back and say we want to have the old normality. I think that we have to really look exactly what our issues in our societies, in our countries are, the global round, and um, to be able to change something and not to go back to new, old normality, but to, to have a new normality and to be very critical as uh, active citizens, as active volunteers with the situation after mm. the pandemic. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point and, and a really good call to action and also a challenge, Wolfgang. So thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Samuel. And thank you to all our attendees who joined us in this, in this hour of conversation. Um, I think, yes, uh, this final slide here, just don't forget to register for the next session. Um, it's gonna be on the March 9th. Uh, volunteers as key actors within civil society dealing with the impact of COVID-19. And you can see here the website where um, you'll be able to register. Again, thank you so much to our speakers, uh, to, our, uh, to our panelists, and to Ayabe for organizing this event. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Have a good rest of your day or night or afternoon. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.